Brilliant. Great. So thanks everyone for um, coming along. I'm also going to start my timer because there's a very real risk that I'll end up waffling for too long and we'll go over. Um, so I'm just going to watch the time, but also uh, anyone feel free to just jump in with anything um, as they feel like it. So we are, we are Open Theatre Scotland. We heard talk about Open Theatre Scotland. Um, it is a, well, I'll probably start off first by saying, um, who are we? It's very much a community collaborative open source project, if you will. There's no sort of one owner. It's very much a whole bunch of people just getting together um, to do this. Now, the whole Open Data Scotland is actually a community of like, I think about 200 different people now uh, in the Slack group. We kind of converse over Slack over uh, Twitter, but the Oddbods project was actually uh, a team or a team or a project that came out of a CTC 23 hackathon back in May last year. And it's, uh, it was just a challenge. It was a challenge that we worked on for a weekend. And then um, I think what we did was we sat for two days and we scraped a whole bunch of data sets for local authorities. We're like, where, what actually, what data sets do we actually have around here? And then went to scrape it. And I remember it was awful. I remember sitting there for a whole day, feeling like this was very painful to go through uh, each website and to figure out uh, what was there and what was not there. And then it just kind of, it just kind of was it. We didn't really do much from it after that. Um, but what happened was we then went on to the Scottish Open Data and Conference in September. And uh, both Jack and myself said, well, actually, we've got something that we worked on now. We actually think has got some potential. What do people think? And then we did a, a small presentation on it. And the feedback from it was actually really good. It was really positive. And a lot of people were saying, actually, this is something that could be very useful for us. So what then happened was we then sort of said, well, great if we think this is actually of value let's actually do something about this let's actually build this and then we set a plan for 12 months so that's just kind of all the different partners if you will we've got the whole open data scotland which is actually a community thing we've got oddbots which is actually just a kind of smaller group if you want to be specific about it um and then the open data.scot website is very much the outcome of of um, these projects, if you will. So the whole purpose of the Open Data Scotland project or Open Data Scotland website, is, if you will, is to um, be able to help people, oop, I've already messed up on my slides, sorry. Um, it's to be able to help people, one, find data, but also actually start to understand uh, what open data there is in Scotland. I'm not really going to go through a lot about what open data is, except to say it should be um, it's freely accessible. It's usually sort of government published. It's data that everyone can use without a license. Um, so there have been attempts. I mean, there are publishers of open data. These tend to be your sort of government agencies, local authorities, we kind of mentioned as well. Um, CEPA is a big publisher of the Scottish Environment Protection Agency. They're a big publisher of open data. There are all these sorts of different organizations organizations that are publishing data. And one of the problems is the fact that nobody, or not that nobody really knows, but if you're going out sourcing for data, you kind of have to know who's producing it to be able to go to their site to go and find it. There's no sort of general space, if you will, to, to go and be like, oh, what potential data can I use? So people don't really know where to go to find the data. It's very reliant on who knows who and who knows what. Quite often at hackathons will be like, oh, does anybody know of this data set or know of a data set or something? And it's a lot of sort of task knowledge that's being passed around from individual to individual. There's no one location to go look for it. If you go and Google it, um, there are some attempts that have been made before, repos, if you will, um, that have been made to try and collate these sources, but th it becomes very clear that they're actually very aged, they're very old, and um, someone with very good intentions built it up before, but then never maintained it, because it is quite a huge effort to try and maintain all these different publishers and all these different sources, and then it just it just kind of dies a death, a very sad death, and, and nobody really gets to use it. Um, and the other problem I think is a lot of people probably don't recognize what the term open data is, so they don't necessarily search for open data in that sense, they just kind of look for data. So these were the kind of um, problems that we were looking to address with this project. I think one of the very key things here was the fact that um, it's that middle bit here about the age, the, the sort of difficulty of maintaining um, a repo or, or collection of data sources, it has to be maintained, it has to be kept up to date, um, otherwise what's the point it just kind of falls away and it's aged and doesn't get used anymore so um i've kind of already covered this by accident and they're really two main objectives to this project um i think besides just sort of being a listing of sources that people can go to and 
search for data that they want, or even just browse to see what data is available. There is another element of it that I think is quite important for this project, and it's that sort of educational, that learning um, piece about it. It's also about being able to understand um, what data is available in Scotland as a whole for the region, and um, you know, learning about what we have, but also learning in the sense that we're able to invite collaborators on to work on this project and also develop your technical skill as well. So it's not just about learning about data, it's also about being able to, to work on a project like this and learn from, from each other. So these are the kind of two um, key main pieces here, if you will. Right, so I mentioned this also very briefly. Uh, we kind of sort of went to Sodu with a bit of an idea of, you know, we think this is good, we think this is okay. Um, and then everyone was like, actually, no, we, we do like this idea. So in order to make it work, we made a 12 month plan. We said, we're gonna to commit to this work for uh, 12 months and then we split it over four milestones. And the four milestones were quite deliberate. So it was almost centered around the fact that we would have a hackathon every weekend, every weekend, every quarter was what I meant to say, sorry, <laughs> we can move a bit too much. And um, every quarter, so we knew there would be this burst of intense activity every three months or so, and then sort of supporting activity either before the event or after the hack to just kind of prepare for the hack and then close up on the stuff that we've done in the hack. And that's what we've done. We just had, we've done three of these now. So the first uh, milestone was to really focus on being able to actually make it something, a service that people could use, want to use. They don't kind of come to it and be like, oh, they don't really know how to navigate this. They don't know how to work with it. And then you just totally turn people away, to turn people off from the service because they don't know what to do with it. So that really was the key thing about the first milestone. We had the data, we now had to be able to present it in a user-friendly way. Um, and then once we actually had it in a user-friendly way, then we went into the back end and sort of fixed all the things that were broken with it, all the, the data quality issues that were there. Um, that was the focus of the second milestone. And then the third milestone, once we had stuff in a, a reasonable reliable state um, we focused on automation and this was actually the most recent one we did it in May um, it's like two weeks ago actually it was I think it was um, and it was a very very successful event um, Jack is going to tell you more about it later and um, but basically we were able to automate the entire pipeline from sourcing all the way to actually publishing the listing so what that means is uh, every week we have uh, fully up to date listing of all of all the data that we know of open data within Scotland. So this really kind of was so key um, in making this project uh, usable, if you will, and something that will, will live on compared to all the other projects that maybe would have existed before where they just kind of died a very sad death because it couldn't get maintained. Um, one also very key important part about this automation milestone is that because we planned the work for a year, this allows us to kind of step away from the project. Uh, we were actively developing it for a year. That was the plan. But now it can kind of run itself. Everything we do on top of it now is just kind of a new feature, a, a new piece, rather than having to focus on actually get it to work. So I'm very happy that we've done that. Right. So I think, yeah, that was just a timeline um, there. So really just an idea of activity that had happened over the last 12 months. It started off with a small hack and then we took it to Sodu in September 2021. Um, in October, we kind of made that plan, committed to that plan, and then it's just been um, sort of the milestone since. I think one of the key events possibly here was when we got web analytics in April. Um, we got a subscription for Plausible, which is a web, an web analytics app software. I don't know quite what quite, quite the term for it is. Um, but it was when we got that embedded and we started to see that people were actually using the website. They were actually coming in and using the service. Then we were like, OK, right, we've actually got to make sure this thing works and it actually works for people. And people are actually using this. It's a bit it's a bit surreal. You know, at first you kind of think nobody's going to visit this, um, maybe only a few people, not many. Right, so I've kind of been talking and I realize it's a little bit abstract. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what we're actually talking about. So this, no, this. So this is the site. Um, this is kind of our landing page, if you will. 
um, we'll talk about JCAN, which is the framework for this later. I'll let Jack talk about it because he's far uh, more uh, informed about that than I am. But this is kind of what we're working with. Th these are all the different data sets um, that we have. And you can see all the different publishers of the data sets. We started with local authorities to begin with. So that's why we are kind of more local authority heavy. Um, and then you can kind of filter to see like what data sets are there. Um, or you can even see them by categories as well. So maybe you just want to see health and let's not go for health and social care because that's always a bit depressing at the moment, isn't it? And, you know, you can look at all these other business and economy pe uh, pieces, if you will, sort of information in and around that category, or you can even search it by a file type as well. Um, you can also search, um, I don't know, cycle seems to be a good one, um, you know, and see like what kind of data sets are around or uh, are available for cycling information around Scotland. So this is kind of the core service, if you will, about being able to scrape everything in and then actually be able to present it to people. So if I look at one of this, for example, um, I'm looking at a data set, I can see that the data set is available in different file formats. I can then click on it, it will take me to the original source and then I can download it and read the original page and however if you want and there's some metadata information. Now one of the important things I probably should highlight is that we don't store the data. It's purely just references to the original source of the data. It's about being able to redirect people um, to the original publisher of the, of the data rather than trying to store and then trying to muck about with keeping that storage and, and the sort of storage constraints you need for that or capabilities you need for that rather. But one thing I do want to show you is this is a very, very nice interface. And this interface came out of that first uh, milestone which was make a nicer interface because out of the very first CTC, this was actually the original uh, listing. And you can see that great big difference between, you know, if a user had just like seen this versus this. I mean, there's no comparison. This is so much nicer. Um, so we didn't want to, to lose. We didn't want to have people sort of turn away and be like, I don't really understand what's going on here. So it's very much an appeal to individual users. Right. So I've kind of talked about that. Um, right. Now we're going to go into the technical. And I'm on time, which is great. Um, so this is the kind of three main areas or three main services um, that we'll probably cover uh, or that Open Data Scotland probably does provide, which is, you know, one, being able to find a data set to kind of demo that very lightly there. Um, and then two is about actually learning about what data there is in what data sets are available for uh, in Scotland and then more about resources. I've not really covered that, but maybe... I'll do that very quickly. So, sorry, my Zoom controls are in the way. So analytics, for example, just very lightly, I mean, it just tells you quite very light pieces about um, who's published and, and where it is. But I think one of the, the nicer ones is actually this map that Jack's built, um, where it actually shows you like which local authorities actually have provided information. And then when you actually, you can actually see them by local authority as well. Now, this actually used to be a bit more of a complicated piece, but we actually then removed it because it became redundant or um, information about what, uh, learning about what open data is, if you will. You've got this resources tab. Um, it's kind of a, a nice listing. It, it hopefully will grow into something in future, but it's a bit static at the moment, but we're just listing like projects that have used open data. Um, and we've got them here by sort of Scotland focus. And we've got like other interesting projects that we think we spotted that are worldwide. Um, and then just sort of other information about how you might use open data and other resources about it. So the, the point of me saying this is, if you have worked on an open data project before, tell us about it. We'll be very happy to list it here. Um, it's kind of important that it's not only that you use the data, I think publishers also have to be able to see that the data is being used by, by individuals. And also it's about visibility. It's about, you know, kind of being like, okay, what's the point of publishing all this open data if it doesn't actually get used? So being able to show that it's being used and people are, are um, valuing it, that's how we kind of maintain or sort of encourage publishers to keep publishing, if you will. In fact, Travelling Tabby has just received an MBE this week, last week, I think, for our services for creating this coronavirus tracker. So, you know, there's some real good that can come out of this um, there. Right. Okay. So now I've given you the context of everything. Now we're going to go into the technical parts of it. So all of that stuff. 
there's a lot. <laughs> and these, these are just all the, the sort of tools, if you will, um, that we use to build up this piece. Um, I did call out project tools because I think it's quite important to talk about how we were able to collaborate across so many uh, people. We are totally volunteer run, volunteer created, if you will. Um, everyone's doing it in their spare time. So um, time is kind of sporadic. No one's kind of focused on it and doing it. You know, some people are, I tend to work late at night, for example, on weekends, um, and other people are working at different times. So how do you kind of keep that communication up between different indi individuals working at different times? Um, so we use a lot of like well, GitHub repos, obviously. We use the GitHub wiki, fun wiki function wiki function for our documentation. Um, projects is kind of like our Trello board. Um, we use Slack and we use Twitter. Twitter is absolutely a communication tool that was used here. So those are kind of surrounding our uh, project pieces, if you will. And all of these, we kind of set up very early on the project, right in October last year. And then we kind of said, this is where we're going to be storing our stuff. This is what we're going to be working off. And then we redirect everyone to, to work in those, those tools. Um, the backend stuff, so this is all to do with being able to actually pull the data, um, sourcing the data, whether or not it's an API call or whether it's a web scraper, um, their stuff. So we pull the data and then we uh, clean it so that we can then consolidate it and put it into one single central store. Um, the storage itself is also on GitHub and the whole after it gets stored, it then gets split up. I'll show you the whole diagram for it later, but it gets split up afterwards to then be able to have that nice little data set um, view that you saw on the front end there. All of that, that backend stuff, almost all of it's in Python. I think there's only one script that's in C and that's Jack's script and that's why he's laughing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this whole thing was pretty much done in Python. Um, the data storage, we just use the stuff that's on GitHub. The pipeline automation is in GitHub Actions as well. Um, and the hosting is also uh, GitHub pages, although we did buy a separate domain for this. So, you know, we've we've pretty much done everything GitHub, Python, that's it for the whole back end. Um, the front end stuff, we did um, get to that point with the help of a very, very useful open source package called JCAN. Um, and Jack probably can talk a bit more about it um, if he wants. But then obviously with your front end stuff, you've got your HTML, your JavaScript, and your CSS to make that all kind of work as well. Um, the web, anal web analytics stuff have kind of touched on it very briefly, but haven't really shown you. That was a um, tool called Plausible Analytics. Um, the visualization, some of them are done in Python, but the newer stuff is done in JavaScript now. And we have a form as well on the page and that's on Google form. Now, the whole point of showing you all of this is we didn't, we didn't really, well, we did buy something. I think Plausible Analytics was the only thing that we kind of spent money on as is the domain, but everything else was an open source tool or a free tool, something that we could use. And one of the things about being open source ourselves was that um, some of the functions like, I think GitHub Actions, because we are open source, we can use it unlimited. Does Jack want to jump in and say something there about that? Yeah, <clears throat> that's that's been sort of the beauty of being able to automate things using GitHub Actions is that if you're running actions on a, an open source repo, uh, you can run them for free. Um, with uh, pretty much an unlimited allowance. I mean, there's a terms of service, I think, that'll block some, you know, misuse and such, but uh, running something, you know, say on a weekly day basis or a daily basis to go and, you know, check some links or scrapes and data is uh, pretty low usage as far as GitHub's concerned. And, you know, they're happy to support that. And, you know, they, they support, you know, a great amount of platforms for that, not just, you know, Linux-based um, platforms. You can also run, um, run scripts using Windows platforms, even Mac platforms. So it's it's uh, really extensible and uh, I think a good tool for open source projects. There you go. So on the right, that's what we're all here for. It's all the Python stuff. Um, so these were all the different packages that we used in Python. Um, Funny enough, I called that Python 3.9 because actually that was one of the big questions in the last hackathon. Everyone was like, what Python, what version of Python are we using? 3.9, we didn't want to touch 3.10 because 3.10 was just problematic. So 3.9 was what we kind of worked on. Um, we probably could have done better with being able to share environments across different users, but I think we just ended up kind of being like, we're just using these packages. Um, we don't know that there are any version conflicts. The only one that we were really a bit concerned about for versioning was just Python, if you will, whereas the rest of it, we were just kind of, kind of okay with it being the latest version, if you will. This is definitely going to bite us at some point in the future, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So <laughs> there you go, a whole lot of listing there. Right, I'm going to move on. Um, oops. 
Right, so I kind of mentioned, this is a little bit of an overwhelming diagram, but I mentioned this flow and hopefully it makes a bit more sense um, once we go through it. So can you see my mouse actually? I'm just wondering. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I talked about everything kind of being built in Python. Um, we have, what happens is we have all these scripts on the left-hand side, you can kind of roughly make up their names. They're all Python scripts, except for one. Um, they're all the difference of either API calls, if they exist, or they are manual web scripts. So I think one, two, three, four are APIs, and these three are web scripts. And the output of these, either the API references or the scrapes is then the data itself, the metadata, which we store in multiple files. Either we store across the multiple files or we store in a single file. It doesn't really matter. We kind of store them all as CSV files within the repo itself. We have one of these that's just sitting there. It's a manual scrape. One day we'll get rid of that, but for now it's just kind of sitting there. Um, so obviously while, while you don't have a script, there is a requirement for someone to have to go and update that data, excuse me, if we want an actual, an actual refresh of that. All of this data then gets pulled into one um, single process, which then gets stored as one single central store. So each one of these each one of these APIs or sources, if you will, they've got different publishers, they've all got different standards, they call different things, different names, it's all sorts. So this is all about being able to kind of standardize it. This one here pulls them all together and they're all stored in the standardized file. So this is where all the sort of processing, the cleaning, the, mer the cleaning, the transforming, the categorization, the renaming, the relabeling, all of that happens here. This is the kind of workhorse centerpiece, if you will. When it gets stored, there's then, you know, it kind of splits off for analytics. Sometimes you want to look at the sort of uncleaned version of the data to be able to make some uh, insights or some, yeah, insights. I'm going to leave it as that. <laughs> and the actual cleaned piece, um, we then process again over time to be able to split out into multiple markdown files, um, which gets consumed by the JCAN front end piece. And that's what you then see on the front. So, right. I am not on time anymore. <laughs> this is, um, we were gonna, well, we are gonna plan to just kind of walk through all the Python stuff. And um, I don't know, Jack, how do you want to do this? Uh, I've obviously got the screen share. Should I just pull it up and then you can talk through it or I don't think we need to talk through all of them. Yeah, I mean, I think you've, well, I think you've kind of just summarized most of, well, most of this. I don't know what you wanted to, what yeah. you wanted to show next. I'll, I'll, show, I'll show a very quick one because this, we did sort of give 15 minutes for it, even though I'm a little bit over. Right, I'll just show one of these. Um, right, so I'm not prepared as always. So this is our uh, repo. I'll maybe bring one of these up. So this is um, one. Is ArcGIS the best example? Maybe. Okay. So this is one of these that are referencing the API directly. This is an ArcGIS API that's calling from. I think what happens is actually we feed it a bunch of URLs. This got changed recently. So yeah. So previously these all used to be sort of different scripts with their own sort of different ways of being coded. I think at, at the back of the last CTC, mm -hmm. Andrew went in and changed them all into sort of class files to sort of unify the experience a bit more so it was pulling all the data sets from one location mm -hmm. and was just it knew which script to run based off of what categorization the script had been given in this file here mm -hmm. so we have here a list of um, the different sources the different publishers that we that we know of um, their name their link and then the sort of the sort of extraction if you want so whether it's ArcGIS or dcat um, or use smart or see kind here. So the one that we were looking there was in ArcGIS. So ArcGIS would go in, you know, find those sources and then process and then get things like the metadata out of it. So things like uh, the name of the data set, the organization that published it, the actual link of the resource, if you will. And then like when it was created, the create time, the update time, and then um, size, if that information is available and then it writes to that store that we're talking of. So this is the one ArcGIS one. Um, DCAT, not 
too dissimilar, but also quite dissimilar <laughs> in that, you know, you can see already there are some things that we just don't have. It's just that that publisher just does not provide that information. So there's a lot of blanks. So we know that anything that comes through DCAT will have um, quite a few missing information, quite a few, quite well, missing information, if you will. And maybe we'll look at some of the manual web scrapers here. So this is this one was a very difficult one, I understand. <laughs> was it um I can't remember their names, Ludo and Harris, was it um yeah. really upset about having to work with this and it took them a whole day to do this. Um the web scraper actually to be very honest, we didn't um I thought I'd seen there, I couldn't really see it. Um I think we were trying to avoid having to do web scraping as much as possible uh, because it's just too different. Every different source has got a different layout. They've got a different set of rules. It's all just very difficult to try and create something. And then some of the sites don't even get updated in like the last four years. So you kind of wonder whether or not it's worth actually creating a web scraper for that. But because the whole point of it was we wanted to be able to automate the pipeline, the web scrapers actually started to make sense because then we shouldn't have to go and manually um, pull this information. We should just be able to refresh it every week or however often and be like, is this change? Has this change? Has anything um, happened here? Because even if it goes down, that's information that could be useful to then act against. So this was something that, as I understand, yeah, so it was using Beautiful Soup um, and quite nice documentation here, functions to actually be able to scrape it and actually pull out the information like the name um, and then the sort of updated date, if you will, file size, all this metadata that we need about these different um, data sets, if you will. So each one of these web scrapers, very different because they're all working with very different um, layouts to begin with. So here we go, here's another one for a different source. Okay, enough about scrapers. And I think the important thing to, sh to highlight here is this is something that used to be a very manual process, even with the scripts that, mm. um, you know, back before we had automation, somebody would have to have these repos cloned on the machine, have the repos cloned side by side, both this one and the actual JCAN site. So, you know, the, the file paths themselves were sensitive. And whenever we wanted the sites, ra you know, sites updated, we would have to rely on that person to, you know, do run each of these scripts in turn, which mm -hmm. was, you know, a manual process in itself. You need to you need to know what order to run them in, um, you need to know what packages you need to get installed and all that. Um, if it if it broke in the progress uh, in the process, that person would probably be the one that would have to troubleshoot, and then the, the commit would go against them when they had to um, update it for the website. Whereas now, um, with the the last CTC. Um, we basically automated that process now, so it goes, um, it runs via GitHub Actions, so it's a consistent environment every time. It doesn't have to touch anybody's sort of personal computer or device or anything like that. Um, it just happens automatically without anybody having to prompt it, um, and it commits it as if it's a, 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 a bot, basically, on GitHub that's committing the message, so it's not kind of tied to anybody's GitHub um, contribution activity as well. So this, if I bring it back to this image, we kind of look at a few examples of these different scrapers. So I think we look at two of these sort of web scrapers and uh, these API ones. So that was kind of that level of work, if you will, sourcing the data. Now we're just going to look at this one in the center that sort of brings them all together. So this is the merge data file. This is the center of it all. And really all it does is it pulls all those different files. So it's just a, a read CSV because if you, oops, yeah, if you look at it, once these all action, they are CSV outputs. And then this one just calls all the different individual ones. Oops, that's not the one, that's the one. So we've got from one source here, we've got another source here, we have another source here, and then you see that in another source here. One thing I probably, mentioned here. I don't know whether it's worth mentioning or not, but in the sort of spirit of collaborative projects, if you will, I think the style of code, I don't know if you've picked up on it, but it's quite different. <laughs> that will be my fault because I wrote it, I wrote, I write quite in quite a linear way, if you will. Um, so 
this is one of the things I guess you're going to get from uh, different people of, of different backgrounds kind of working together on this. Um, so that's an interesting one. So it combines it all together and then it saves it. Um, and there's this whole piece about relabeling stuff here. So if the names aren't quite correct, we need to correct them to uh, something that the system will actually recognize so that it can match them together. Um, there's tidying up of strings. So like some, some of the data sets have categories and there are multiple categories. And then some people separate their categories with commerce and some with semicolons and it's all a bit messy so we need to make sure that's all consistent it's things like that that you kind of need to uh, pull together when you've got different sources working on it uh, different sources pulled into the same location um there's um yeah just combining data sets and there's a whole piece here about recategorization based on keywords that we've got um in the data sets and these are all functions as well, by the way, I probably should call, I probably should mention. And then this is one about um, tidying the licensing um, that we have within there. So all these different data sets may have different license names, but actually they're meant to be the same thing. So it's about making them consistent. So they display consistently on the front end. So that's that middle bit. That's that big chunk. It then saves to a CSV file and then it goes to a splitter Oops. very quickly. Um, what it does is again the style of code changes again. <laughs> this is proper proper styling, um, and what this does is it takes that now that we've got everything from separate sources and we put them all together in one standard source. This then splits it out into a format that JCAN can sort of consume, um, and it's split out by sort of um, the organization, the publisher and the name of the title. So if you imagine this whole thing, it just kind of iterates over. It's like for every organization data set, group it together. This is one this is one piece. And then for every sort of organization data set, part two, this is one piece. And it goes out and it creates multiple uh, markdown files. And the result is, let's see if I have the result. No, that's not it. The result is this. We have a whole bunch of um, markdown files then they get consumed by the sort of JCAN front end. So that was quite uh, a load of information there. I don't think I'm going to go. Uh, no, I actually have gone through them all. Um, and we have talked about GitHub Actions. So I'm just going to wrap up because we did want to leave a chunk of time for um, if anybody had any questions and we can talk about any of the other individual pieces uh, in there. So. The only thing I didn't touch was visualizations and GitHub actions, but Jack's kind of mentioned a bit about that. Um, yeah, so also kind of mentioned the sort of challenges of working on a project like this. There was inconsistent standards. Uh, every I think we've got something like 32 different publishers at the moment. Um, that seems to be the number that sticks out. Um, and they've all got their own different way of doing things. Not all of them are using the same API. Some of them are just, obviously some of them are web scripts because we're getting them from their website. And it's, you know, then be able to sort of recognize actually this naming standard here is the same as this naming standard in this other organization. Let's make it the same thing. How do you recognize it and make it the same thing? Um, if you have missing information, what do you do with that? Do you just kind of proxy it with something else? Do you ignore it? Uh, what's the treatment there? Um, the rest of the challenges here were really about how we collaborate with a lot of people over such a long time frame. This is a 12 month project, if you will, um, and different people are working at different times in their own free spare time. Um, how do you keep them informed? How do you make that information available? Um, I think we hit milestone two. So that was like three months after we decided to actually do this properly and then turned up to a second hackathon. And I was like, I can't remember any of this. I don't remember what goes where. I don't remember how this is all supposed to fit together. So it's like, okay, no, actually we need to pay attention to our documentation here and actually record stuff, not just for other people, but also for ourselves. When we go back and pick something else up after a few months, after a break away from it, you just forget. Um, actually how these things all connect to each other. So documentation was actually a really big piece of it and then being able to um, explain it to other people so that when they came on, when they were joining us for short spits of time, we were able to bring them up to speed very quickly and be like, this is the whole project. This is the kind of piece that you're working on. 
and help them understand that very quickly. Um, so that's where that breaking tasks into bite-sized chunks also was a bit of a challenge. Um, you know, being able to make something that was challenging enough that people will want to work on it, you interest them uh, with a nice little challenge, but also not so difficult that it's overwhelming that they can't, they just don't want to do it and just kind of go like, no, not going to do that. So that's a, that's a little bit of a challenge. And then the last one was just being able to um, tell people that this service exists, but um, I don't know how people are finding it. It's it's very nice. It's very nice to see that. And that takes me very nicely to the wins because one of the best things about doing this open source, open data project has been um, actually seeing that people have been using the service. And I can't explain like how nice a feeling that is, just knowing that you've built something useful. Um, the ability to work with a whole broad range of people with broad range of skills, um, being able to learn from each other. I think we've all come with different uh, skills and different perspectives on this, and you're not going to get that when you work on a solo project by yourself. So um, that's been very nice. Um, so what's kind of in the future for the project? We have work planned till September this year. That's the end of our 12th month um, plan. That's our fourth milestone. And the next one that we've got is to add on more sources. So we've got 32 at the moment. I don't know how many more we're going to get. Uh, we've got a few lined up already, but one of the things we're going to have to do is actually, we know that there are a lot of organizations that do publish open data that we don't really know of yet. So it's part of the work is having to go and find out who they are, um, where they are, and then do one whole big weekend of getting that all updated. I think very much all the work up and now has been able has been about kind of creating that structure so that we can then scale up when we do actually have um, more data to add to it. Um, I talked about the plan being for 12 months. The work doesn't kind of stop there. It's just that that's just the active development that we planned. The domain does run to 2023. So even if we don't do anything after September, it's still going to be there. Nothing's really going to happen to it. Um, and because it's automated now, it basically can run itself um, without us getting involved. Um, we are going to take it to SODU 2022 this year, which is in November, I think, um, and just kind of present it again and say, right, we've done 12 months of work. Now, last year we talked about this, we had this, um, and 12 months later we now have this uh, functioning service. What, what should we do next with it as a sort of group? You know, what, what do we think is um, best next to do with it? Um, a few ideas that I've put down the bottom there to try and tempt people into thinking about me contributing it is, you know, things like Twitter bots, I think would be quite a nice addition um, to the service if we can automate stuff like, oh, this is the top data set this week, or um, somebody suggested sort of tweeting whatever source or publisher it was to be like, hi, your site is down. <laughs> please go fix it sort of thing. Um, so that's a potential piece. That's a potential feature that we can add. Uh, we're talking about being able to um, do some sort of NLP maybe on the data set categorization. So rather than relying on sort of human categorization, we're gonna be able to extract or determine the categorization from either the title or the description of the data set itself. And um, so uh, a bit better, better uh, smarter categorization, if you will talked about maybe being able to do some sort of recommendation engine or like you see there a rating review system. So these are the potential things. That's the that's the beauty of this. It started off with a very, very small, simple idea. And it's now, you know, got this potential to develop um, to just add on more and more functionality onto it. So how can you get involved if you want to get involved? And um, just using the site, I think, is is grand. Um, it allows us to sort of figure out, you know, if you've got a project um, and you're looking for open data, um, if you find that that's actually a useful resource for you and you actually successfully were able to find what you're looking for, I think that's a fantastic win for us. Letting us know would be great, even if you just tweet us or message us, however it is. You can, of course, um, as Python users, and you have seen that the majority of what we do is in Python, we are very, very happy for people to come on and join. Um, even if it's like tiny little things, it's really fine. Sometimes there are little bugs that need to be fixed. Sometimes there are slightly bigger features um, that we would like to introduce, like you've kind of seen that list above. So anything really, if you just kind of go like, oh, I wonder if I can work on something um, very light and contribute to this, um, you know, give us a shout and we'll, we'll find something. Uh, one thing I will plug here is that it's uh, good to have an open data, open source project on your CV or your portfolio. Just 
drop that in there. Um, partly because you can kind of direct people to it and be like, I helped with this project and they can see your credentials on it um, rather than sort of confidentiality reasons. So yeah, that really was it. So I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> Any questions, thoughts? Um, opinions? I know. <laughs> No, it's a clap, I think. It was a, a clap reaction. Oh. <laughs> I don't have a question. Well. So, um, question for Jack and Callum. Um, do, do you want to show us the plausible stats, for instance? Oh, yeah. I can do that. So, oops, that's not the one. That's not the one. But that is the Google form. Um, here we go, plausible. So these are um, our web views in the last 30 days, if you will. We can see where they're coming from and we can see which pages or which data sets pages specifically are uh, the most popular. Most of them are sort of our information ones, if you will. But once you start to go into them, you can actually see things like, um, oops, uh, like this one. This one seems to be very popular. This one is about contracts register. I don't know why, but there you go. So yeah, that's the possible one. Was there something you wanted to highlight there, Ian? No, no, just because you've mentioned that, I thought that interesting people see it for your time. Um, mm. Yeah. And that was a good question to Jack as well. Do you, do you want to show the GitHub actions, not particularly perhaps running, but actually show them where it sits and things? Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to, can you navigate to that, Karen, if you're sharing yep. the screen? Could you just yep. go to the root of Open Data Scotland? So, um, yeah, we've got five repositories that are set up at the moment. We started off with, well, the odd bods one that we started off with um, actually was originally a Code the City um, repository that I think we mig migrated out into our own Open Data Scotland org that we've got set up now. So that's where sort of we started off with all of our data scraping and script writing and all that sort of stuff. And we still keep a lot of that in there. Um, the JCAN repository that we've got there is the actual hosted site, Open Data Scotland. So that's the, the static site generator that's um, using Jekyll and hosted on um, GitHub pages. Um, just recently with the automation, we spun up opendata.scot underscore analytics, which does a daily dump of the analytics data from, from the website. So, um, you know, we're practicing what we preach here, as well as just asking other people to publish open data. We're publishing our own and doing a dump of the JSON data from that analyst graph on a daily basis. So everybody can go back and, you know, if they want to do analysis on how many people are visiting our website and when, then they're, they're free to go do that. Um, but I suppose the, the, the real sort of golden data, uh, the golden repo that's in there now um, that we set up at the last CTC is the pipeline one. Um, yeah, if you go to the actions link and go to the last one that's got a tick on it. Um, and we'll ignore the one that didn't work. Hmm? We'll ignore the one that didn't work. Yep. It well, one? it did work. It just was complaining because it didn't have anything to commit because it was up to date. Uh, yeah, so this is the sort of, um, this is the workflow that it runs through on GitHub Actions to run the various scripts. Um, and then at the end of that, it will make a commit message as a bot. Uh, so that all runs uh, as a GitHub Actions script, um, which is a, a YAML file basically made up of a, a list of different command line things. So I think if you go to the set, I don't know if it's the settings cog or the three dots up in the top right, Karen. Um, you, the cog the or the dots, okay. Yeah, and go view workflow file. Um, this is the configuration for the job. So there's various different types of sort of um, ways that you can start off a GitHub action job. You can start it to, you know, you can get a button set up so you can run it whenever you want. You can set it up to run on a cron schedule so it runs you know on a regular basis the most frequent that you can get on github actions i think is every 10 minutes or something like that but we run i think the most frequent stuff that we run is on like a daily basis for checking links and um, so that fits our use 
Um, but I mean, there's loads of other ways that you can trigger jobs. You can trigger jobs on like pushing of commits, um, pull requests, stuff like that. So I know um, quite a lot of organizations that have development teams will use GitHub Actions actually to run their um, continuous integration pipeline and their deployment pipeline. Um, so it's completely sort of cloud hosted by GitHub rather than having to deal with running something like Jenkins on-prem and all that. But yeah, it's just basically a YAML file with a list of um, command line um, scripts basically bolted into it that run um, and make all the magic happen. I just want to do a shout out because I can see Manpreet's on this call. Um, and Manpreet built this, um, he worked on this, he did this whole piece at the last hackathon um, two weeks ago and it was his first time at our first time on the project first time working with us so you know I think that's really impressive to be able did a to fantastic job build yeah. this piece totally so and am I right to say then um, if we develop more scrapers and things then it would be a simple ish matter just to add them to this workflow at the appropriate points and so on yeah Yep, we would just add in another step to the workflow for that scraper. Um, and it would, well, we can either do a manual sync or we can just wait until the next time on a Friday at lunchtime when it'll run and it'll get added in. One of the newer things that we add in that I think there's a screenshot on one of the slides is we've now got a Slack bot set up in the Open Data Scotland Slack group so that now um, when it does a sync on a Friday, um, it'll send us a wee message to say and it'll... Um, give you a link to the commit so we can go in and see what's actually changed hopefully in future we can get that to give more information out and say i've added x amount of data sets removed y amount of data sets these data sets that were in there have been changed in some sort of way um and as well as putting that on slack we can maybe put that on twitter as well like we said that's a twitter bot could could be coming down the line i reckon i think yeah i think that's definitely gonna happen <laughs> um lee's got his hand raised um, yeah, so have you thought about um, including an API, web API, so that people can query your system and say, you know, give me updates when there's a new feature API set added and you build on top of it? I didn't quite catch the second part of that. Where you say, is it an API for querying mm -hmm. the list uh, of data sets we've got? Or? Yeah, so I have like an API, a web API, that people could query if you have like, uh, something uh, for in your API asking when is there a new fishery data, um, data set added or something like that and we can build stuff on top of, of the sun. Yeah, so I mean a version, version history is definitely in the pipeline that we'd like to do so that people can get a more detailed look at how, how, the, um, how the system's changing on a, mm. you know, on a weekly basis. For now, we're sort of relying on um, the Git repository to be the, the version control history for that. Um, I don't know if you can pull up, Karen, whether the last Git commits from JCAN, um, just to show the, the diff. So you're going to have to guide me here. JCAN. Yep. And, uh, and then sets. just just click on the data set sync, just that, that, that last commit that happened, yep. So this is what we're relying on at the moment is um, basically that diff happening, which we had a we had an issue recently that I've now fixed where um, erroneously categories mm -hmm. jumping about in the um, in data files were getting counted as as a change, um, which was happening due to an issue with one of our scripts. But I think uh, some of the there's public health Scotland stuff in there. Actually that script that syncs maybe not a good idea because I think that's the one I did for the one that it failed, wasn't it? No, that's the one that fixed all the ordering of the categories. So you maybe want to look at the one before that. Uh, yeah, if you go to the commit list. Actually, look at the first one that happened on that Friday. Yeah. Um, and then if there's some public health Scotland ones. Yeah. Um, oh, there we go. So there's a change to that one on waiting times. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or, or um, date updated. Yep. So this is basically all we've got in the case of uh, a version history at the moment, which isn't the most user-friendly thing. So we'd like to take that and, mm. you know, 
expose that to the, the site and make it a bit more human readable. Yeah, it's one of the things. Not for human readable, but for machine readable, so that other apps can be built on top of your I mean, the, the repo is public, so anybody could go in and look at the version history. We do also have, which I think, Karen, you were just the way to show, was the, the CSV and the JSON feeds of the, yeah. in the resources yeah. section. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. I take, your, I take your point, though, about being able to feed it through an interface, basically. Um, usually when these suggestions happen, I say, I'm going to create a ticket for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to create a ticket. Anyone is very welcome to work on it. Absolutely. I think um, you've got an you've got an absolute point there for someone else to be able to use that. I wonder, um, and one of the things maybe in future as well is one of the reasons why we call out all these different projects that are using open data is the dream is one day we'll be able to find a project that says this project use this data source and then we can link the data source and you're able to see the relationship and maybe vice versa as well. When you're looking at the data set, you can see this data set in this listing is used in these different projects. And if you have an interface like that, that you know, a computer reading interface to know when updates have uh, happened, when changes have been made, that's going to be very, very useful to people who are creating data products because then they'll know whether or not something has broken that requires them to fix it. So yeah, absolutely. I think you know, being able to I can't mind the word for it, but you're right. Being able to create an interface for that would be great. An API for that would be great. Yeah, okay. So thank you for that. Any, any other questions from the room or yeah. indeed from anybody online? Yeah. Uh, but like, hello, can you hear me? Um, barely. Do you know where the mic is? <laughs> we don't know How about now. Yeah, yeah, it's getting, yes. it's getting clear. Yeah. yeah. All right, hi. So could you Fantastic. go back to the analytics page, please? Yeah. I have got two questions, actually. The one with the plausible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. OK, so my, I have two questions, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one is, um, I'm guessing for this um, analytics view we're seeing on the front end, why, why use plausible? Um, what, what informed your decision to use plausible as opposed to probably things like Google Analytics or the other form of um, analytics software? So what, what um, informed your decision to use plausible and also the data that you use to populate this and the front end as in being able to find out um, the browser that um, consumers use to access the site, uh, which of the, uh, the devices, as you can see here, the country, and also the pages that were viewed the most. How did you source that data also too? How did you source it to be used on plausible? So those are the two questions. I don't know if you got me. I didn't really understand the second one. We'll get to it. I can, but... I can help okay. with the second one. Okay. Do you want to do the second one then? Uh, yeah. So um, Plausible works off of a JavaScript-based script, the same as something like Google Analytics, if you're familiar with that, where uh, when you sign up for it, uh, the, the organization will give you a script that you embed into the every page of your website. And that JavaScript will then phone home to Plausible servers and send various um you know various details analytics wise as to you know what pages people are accessing where they came from which they can get from you know the header url of the website pages they've you know, visited figure out roughly where you're coming from based off of your ip um and you know determine your browser you know what browser you're using or what um operating system using the um the user agent string um i mean it's not Analytics, uh, speaking as a web developer, analytics has never really been a totally reliable thing as anybody can pretend to be, you know, anywhere in the world using a VPN or, you know, they can change their browser user agent string. But I think we get, I think for what we're using it for, it gives us a pretty accurate representation for what we're looking at. Um, I think to, yeah, to answer the second, qu the first question, um, we did have an extensive sort of conversation about this, which Karen's got up here um, oh, on okay. GitHub. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that came down to it was privacy concerns with using something free for Google uh, Google Analytics. That you know, if if you're not paying for it, um, you know, you're probably you know, you are probably the customer basically. And I know that you know we're saying we're getting a load of things for free with it being open source. But I think it's sort of a different mentality providing data to google versus publishing open source data to 
um you know on github mm. um i don't know does that answer your your questions yes 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 thank you well, i'll kind of add to it just very lightly at the start it was a it was a, between um this project called Mat matum i don't know how you pronounce it matamo Mat matumo whatever it is um there or google analytics that was the two original ones that we came up with and then plausible came in because actually what happened was i've got um I've got repo alerts on another open data portal somewhere else. And then they were having a conversation about putting plausible in. And I was like, oh, what's this plausible thing? And I went to look at it and I thought, oh, this is quite interesting. And then shared it with our team internally. And then we found out that plausible was cheaper um, than Matomo, however you pronounce that. And we pretty much went like, actually, this is good enough for us. And um, I think it's 93 pound a year um, to run it. And it's fine, it's doable. And so, I mean, before we made the decision to jump in and pay the money as well, we did the full, I think, 30 day trial on that. And yeah, we did you know, do it. Yeah, definitely decided we were happy with that before we decided to take it forward. It was very easy to embed. Uh, it was very easy to use. So those were kind of the, the sort of group of reasons, if you will, um, how we came to that. But if you want an in-depth read, it is in the ticket. <laughs> it's there. One of the good things about working openly, I suppose. All right. Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you for your question. It was a good question. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Um, a question, just a comment. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a student at the University of Aberdeen right now. And during the last three months, I had to code for web applications all based on open data. And we have been provided by some data sources by our course or program director. And I checked this web page. Uh, open Data Scotland is not on his website. A suggestion for an open data source. So maybe a suggestion for you: reach out to the universities yes. because they make their students kind of use open data. At least uh, University of Aberdeen does. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so the students will use it. Yes. Yeah. They might give you feedback. They might collaborate. Uh, yeah. 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 Feedback. Totally. And yeah, because I, <clears throat> I really like to use open data from Scotland. I'm not Scottish, but I live here. So why not using data? Exactly. From here? Yeah. And I didn't really find initially. So yeah. the first two uh, web applications, I had to use other data sets. So yeah. For the last two, I found sources, but I think uh, one of them was on Kaggle. So yeah, I think yeah. open data Scotland would have been better. There you go. I mean, that, that's exactly the problem um, that, that we face as well. I also had that when I was doing my course at RGU as well. I'm sure all of us students, that's kind of maybe our first foray into open data without realizing that that's open data as well. Um, you know, it's when you go looking for something to use that you, you can use for your courses. Um, and then suddenly you go like, oh, actually, why isn't this just better provided for everyone? How do we make this easier? And one of the key things is we all have the skills to be able to make that um, more available to other people as well. So absolutely, I take your point 100% that, and that's one of the challenges there. It's, you know, getting people to know um, that this service exists. And that's why I also listed Twitter as one of our project tools, because it's about getting the message out there. It's about being able to connect with those people. And then not just also, as you say, um, as a resource list, but also to encourage uh, the students to participate and and be in these community uh, collaborative events as well because being able to share all these ideas you learn so much out of them you learn how people work as well yeah and one more suggestion i don't know if you can also made it but uh it was for example for the first assessment uh checking the website of Aberdeen city council because they have some open data sets but on their website it's not written no also saw it on your website it's not written how many data the data set con contains how many rows mm. of data. Uh, it would well, be very helpful if this is kind of listed on your web page because yeah. if you see as a student it's only 30 rows uh, then I know if I have to use like 2000 rows then yeah if right. you can skip the data set so yeah this would be really helpful. I agree 100% so challenge number five sounds like you're kind of challenge. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I agree. Exactly. It's all these little things that we can add on to make the whole thing a bit better. That's why we're saying, you know, you start with such a simple idea and then you're able to build and build and build and, and really make it a really robust service. And um, Lee's got his hand up again. Thank, thank you for the comments, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I found a, a link on your website.
I can't really hear you. I find the link losing to work in Chrome. I don't know if you can live debug it. Okay. Let us know how that goes. <laughs> Actually, don't let me know. Let Jack know. <laughs> yeah, if you, if, if you can pass it on to me, either uh, you know, on, on the, in the chat and Zoom or via Slack, then we can look into that and see, see what um, the issue is. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, folks. So, fantastic presentation. Uh, really well explained the project. Um, Karen, you've got the challenges up there. So I, think I do. Time. We've got just about an hour and 10 minutes or something until we wrap up here. Um, yeah. So do you want to, to just speak about the possible challenges for coders yes. tonight? Yes. I don't know how everyone wants, want, everyone wants to organize themselves, but I just kind of thought I'll put some ideas out there and then see how you feel, what you want to do. Um, these are all very much based on the stuff that we do. Um, don't feel pressured about having to get something that works because, oh, sorry, I'm just moving everyone around, because um, you're kind of working in this environment. Absolutely, as Ian's pointed out, you've only got an hour really to do it. Um, but you know it, it's nice to be able to interact with it. So um, I've got five challenges here, um, all kind of based on the concept that we talked about already. The first challenge is about being able to scrape a new data source. Um, I've given you the link, the, the, the organization that we want to scrape. In fact, I think they actually came to us and said, how come our data is not on your site? And we're like, okay, we'll add you next time. Um, so this is, the, this is the first one of it. So if you want to try a little bit of web scraping, there's this one, I've suggested a specific um, subset of their data because they've got a, a huge mix of data, but these are just two CSV files I think they have. So that's one, if you want to try web scrapers and you can um, work off the work that um, the brilliant contributors have already done at the last CDC 23. So you can kind of take that and modify it if you want. So that's an opportunity to work with beautiful soup. Um, this challenge too is kind of after that. So after you scrape the data, how do you then sort of make it standardized so that it can go into um, the same data store, that sort of standard data store piece. Now, it kind of does follow challenge one, but if you want to skip challenge one, you can just get the CSV metadata. So that's here. And then it's just about being able to extract data out of it. So that's what challenge two is about. Um, challenge three is about the analytics. So we kind of mentioned that um, we were showing you the sort of data for the analytics earlier, the different JSON files. So this is an opportunity to work with multiple JSON files. How do you sort of go across different JSON files to get um, the total number of visits for the last seven days? So there's a bit of a time period piece here. It's just about, you know, can you get the number really? But I've set a scene around in future, we would like to put this in a, in a Twitter bot, which I actually do not think is a bad idea. So we'll go with that. Challenge four is about um, setting up a GitHub action. This is very much a wild card one. And <laughs> Jack will have to lead this. So I think if you're interested in that, <laughs> speak to Jack. <laughs> and challenge, challenge five um, is about getting the number of instances from each data file, uh, which was very correctly sort of identified as something that would be very useful. I totally agree. It's um, the, the difficulty in that is how do you traverse across all the different file types? We've got so many different file types, probably just want to start with CSV files. Um, first, how do you sort of iterate through the whole lot of it, get the information um, and then print it out? And then it's not just number of instances. Obviously, when you've got tabular file, tabular data that's like in CSV files, you've got rows and columns as well. So do you want to pull those two sets out or do you just want to pull out just number of instances? So that's um, a, an interesting challenge there. It is an existing ticket. So, um, you know, it's something that we can work on after that. So that's all the different challenges. I don't know how you want to... I'm just, I just realized it's still recording. So we stopped recording just now. So we can okay. share it later. Um, okay.